Welcome to Project You. This podcast explores how integrating changes into your day can produce the best in health, longevity, and performance. We've recruited experts from around the globe who unleash their wisdom to transform your world. Project You dives into how to live a fully optimized life and uncovers tools and techniques to unleash your maximum potential. You only get one shot at this life. So let's get started. All right, welcome to another episode of the Project You podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Schwent. I'm a board certified physician. I practice functional and sports medicine. I'm trained as a emergency physician, I've done trauma critical care, uh, worked as a flight physician, and I'm very passionate about the topic that I'm going to discuss in this session. The concept is intermittent fasting, and this isn't new. It's really been around for 70, 80 years, probably longer. Thinking back to the caveman days where man went days between eating when there wasn't food or it was cold in winter and there wasn't produce to eat. And so the power of this yeah, can't be understa- is often understated. I mean, it's just amazing, the science behind it and what it can do, not only in terms of longevity, but also just health in general is very powerful. And so I want to share that with you in this episode. If you have any questions, please, please reach out to me, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, the blog, Mitchell MD, anywhere that you can find me. I'm happy to discuss this further if you have specific questions to answer those. This presentation is actually part of the Men's Health 1.0 course that I teach on Udemy. Uh, Currently, almost 2,000 students in there, not all men. There's actually probably about 25% women in there, which is really pretty cool that women are learning about how to make their partner, their their man healthier. And so there's a a lot of discussion going on with with that. If you jump over to the blog at MitchellMD.com, you'll see a little image of the course there that is an access pass, if you will, that allows you to get into that course for about 75% uh, less than Udemy charges. So anyways, let's get into it. So I'm very excited about this talk. This is about the 120-year diet. Some might argue 125 and beyond, but let's just go with 120. So the concept here is intermittent fasting, relying on nutrient-dense food products and including vital and essential nutritional cofactors to optimize health. This is very cool stuff, but the interesting thing is it's not new. The 120-year diet was coined by Dr. Walford back in the 1950s. This data has really been around for 70, pushing 80 years, and Dr. Walford promoted undernutrition without malnutrition. That's an important concept. It's not starvation. It's not complete fasting and eliminating all nutrients. The concept is reducing calories to about 40% of, at that point, what was a 2,000-calorie diet. It was pretty standard at the time. Unfortunately, our current standards have really ballooned. The average U.S. intake for males is around 2,640 calories a day, maybe a little less for women. just depends on the source that you cite. For some people, it's much more than that. So our caloric intake has literally exploded. Just look around at the obesity epidemic. Calories to pounds, it really varies what source you use. The general school of thought is right around 3,500 calories equals a pound of fat. And so just look at the sugar content and the caloric content of a non-diet soda, and you get a pretty good idea of how many pops sodas you can drink in a week and how easy it is to put on weight. So the basics of caloric restriction are a diet that includes vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are plant-based nutrients. For those of you who know me uh, outside of the uh, confines of this uh, discussion, know that I'm a plant-based professional chef, and so I'm very keen on plant-based nutrition. Notice that I didn't mention anything about a cow sandwich. That's what uh, some of my colleagues and my kids refer to uh, cheeseburgers. And so the range is anywhere between 40 and 70% of, of caloric restriction. Different methods are certainly uh, implicated in, in, in intermittent fasting. My preference is uh, I like to fast for 12 to 16 hours, uh, sometimes up to 24 hours. I usually try and do that once a week, just depending on what my, my schedule and my training load is like for the endurance events that I compete in. Um, some people will, will sort of pack it together for several days in a row, uh, just, it just varies. There's different ways to do it. And so why does this work? What 
is so powerful about intermittent, intermittent fasting and is there really a rationale behind it? And it's pretty cool. There's some good science behind it. This isn't new. This has been incorporated into our genetic makeup since the Stone Age uh, when, when man would go maybe days without eating because there was no fresh kill, there was no fresh food source. Maybe it was winter. There wasn't a lot of plants, sources of nutrition around, and, and intermittent fasting was just a normal part of life back then. And so how does it work? And so we know that it has effects on the cardiovascular system. It decreases heart rate, decreases blood pressure, decreases bad cholesterol, the LDL, and also triglycerides are decreased. Those are also risk factors for heart disease and stroke and also pancreatitis. It improves insulin. Insulin is what gets sugar into our cells, and it improves the sensitivity of insulin. If you've listened to some of the other uh, uh, lectures and talks and presentations I've given, it's very evident that insulin resistance is a huge problem in this country, and it also helps to normalize glucose levels. Intermittent fasting increases protein synthesis. It gets rid of some of the abnormal proteins that our body produces. Uh, you know, at times our cells go haywire and don't really produce the t- kind of protein that's beneficial. And, you know, I hate to dump a bunch of science into this, but I think it's important to give a little bit of background and validity into how this works. But there are chaperone molecules that help enzymes do what they need to do. And so this improves the synthesis and maintenance of the essential proteins, the building blocks of our muscles, our bodies. It also helps with uh, cell death. Cells die. uh, They wear out. Uh, For example, red blood cells live about 120 days. And the body has a way of just basically sending them out to pasture to die. And so intermittent fasting helps regulate this process. It improves the repair of our DNA, our genetic makeup, and it helps maintain the integrity of our DNA. And it also benefits something called transcription. Transcription is a process of taking DNA, our genetic messages, and turning them into a variety of tissues, whether that's cells or protein or whatnot. And, it, and intermittent fasting helps with that. It also reduces oxidative stress. I've kind of hammered this point home before in some of the uh, posts and on other podcasts and, and other, other talks I've given. You can think of free radicals as little wrecking balls whipping around in your body, damaging tissues, damaging blood vessels, damaging cells, and causing aging. Intermittent fasting helps to reduce not only the number but the severity of these little wrecking balls. It also helps reduce uh, body fat mass. Visceral fat is a huge problem. There's something called skinny fat, which I've talked about before. Uh, Just look around. You can see people who have a relatively slim build, uh, maybe a little bit of a a pooch or or tummy. That's visceral fat. Visceral fat is is bad. It's dangerous. Visceral fat increases the risk of of cardiovascular disease. And so intermittent fasting helps to reduce that fat burden on the body. And and, uh, the corollary is it also increases lean muscle mass. Increases muscle mass. Muscle is much more efficient in burning calories. And so the overall effect as you would guess, is weight loss. It also boosts hormone secretion. Intermittent fasting improves the age-related decline of two important hormones. One is growth hormone. That's the hormone that helps your body repair and recover. It's produced when you're resting and sleeping at night. And also DHEA, which I won't get into the specifics here, but these are very crucial to optimal living. It also improves brain function. I mean, who doesn't want to have a more functional brain, particularly as we age? It improves memory, mood, and cognition. This might seem controversial. I mean, when you're hungry, you may be a little bit crabby, but the overall result is improvement in these three areas of mental function. It also improves engagement and activity. Uh, you know, when you're bogged down with a heavy meal, fatty meal, you're kind of tired, lethargic, sluggish, intermittent fasting actually increases the engagement of people to get out there and do some activity. The cool part also is it stimulates another growth factor called BDNF. BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Your brain is much more resilient, much more plastic, if, if you'll use that term. If I, if let me use that term for a minute. It, it is, allows the brain to adapt and grow, transform, and repair itself. Very critical to long-term cognitive function. And here's the big one. Weight loss. Huge problem in our country. There are some things that people can take that are called mimetics. They're, they're mimicking calorie restriction. I'm not going to get into a lot of the science behind this, but I just want to give some examples of some that have been studied and have some proof in the scientific literature about having a similar effect to intermittent fasting. 
metformin. It's a pill that many type 2 diabetics take to sort of regulate their blood sugar. Interesting that that medication has a huge effect on the bugs in the gut, and it's a whole talk in itself. It's very fascinating, but it definitely uh, Im- improves uh, sugar balance and also is implicated in longevity, dementia, Alzheimer's, and a variety of other things. Resveratrol, that's in red wine. Carnosine, which is different than carnitine. Avocado, who doesn't love an avocado? One of my favorites is ALA, alpha lipoic acid. It improves insulin sensitivity, helps regulate blood sugar, and uh, very powerful. You need the uh, L-form to uh, acetyl L-form to cross the, the uh, blood-brain barrier. And uh, I mentioned this before in terms of uh, uh, treatment and cognitive uh, decline, dementia, etc. And acetyl L-carnitine. So, the 120-year diet. What's the threshold? Is it 120 years? Is it 125? We don't know. The science is really exploding. Epigenetics, nutrigenomics. Two different words, very cool, very powerful. I'm involved in a breast cancer uh, research foundation, and we deal a lot with the effects of nutrition on genetics, how certain things that you eat in your diet can really turn on and turn off a variety of genes, a variety of enzymes and proteins to help the body better process toxins, hormones, metabolize estrogen, testosterone. It's very fascinating. The The science on this is just exploding right now, and it's really going to be the key to determining how long the human can actually live. Very fascinating stuff. Thanks for listening to this episode of Project U. Head over to iTunes and leave a review or join the conversation on the blog at MitchellMD.com. Have a great week.